Welcome to the GoTo Podcast. In this episode, Nikki Watt, CTO and CEO at Open Credo, and Ken McGrage, Principal Technologist at ThoughtWorks, discuss why continuous delivery is finally taking off, along with how microservices and serverless fit into the picture. Created for developers by developers, GoTo gathers the best minds in the software community. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in Chicago, Amsterdam, and Copenhagen, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conferences YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. My name is Preben. I'm sitting here at GoTo Copenhagen, and I managed to bring together Nikki and Ken and we're here to talk a little bit about um, software improvement. Before we kick off, I would just ask the two of you if you could just quickly introduce yourself. Sure, so uh, my name is Nikki Watt. I'm the CTO at a company called Open Credo, and uh, we help companies to adapt and adopt emerging technologies to solve their business problem, uh, working quite a bit in the distributed systems space. Uh, I'm Ken McGrage. I'm a principal technologist with a company called ThoughtWorks. Uh, mostly working in continuous delivery and stuff for most about the past decade. So continuous delivery, I heard about that first time 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling it's taking off now and not until now. Why is that? Um, so a lot of it is the availability of infrastructure. So although the, there was a white paper called the Software Production Line that was from Agile 2006, we still were mostly deploying onto physical hardware or very expensive data centers and, and such. It wasn't as easy to get the end-to-end. -end. There was still a lot of uh, silos in the organizations. We own the hardware and you can't have it and you have to fill out a report that was, says why you need a virtual machine and then we'll establish a virtual machine and now you can continuously deploy to it. Uh, whereas today, and really for several years now, people, it's a lot easier to, to provision that hardware in the, in the sky. You know, I fly a lot and I don't see things in the cloud, but they say it's the cloud. Um, it's just easier to get your hands on the equipment to do it, is a big part of it. So it needed a change in the organization oh, yes. and not in the technique. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. How still to apply this to a project, mm -hmm. there must be some kind of overhead. It's work that you need to do. Mm -hmm. So how big should the project be in order for this to make sense. Yeah, I actually contend that there is no low bar that as soon as you're doing it, because um, your continuous integration and continuous delivery are, are practices. They're not technologies that you add. Um, and so if you're creating new software and you start writing tests at the very beginning, that's just a good thing, because now you have tests. Um, and if those tests are running and you know you're going to be deploying to a public cloud, for example, then you should be deploying to that public cloud as often as possible to make sure that you didn't break that process. So even the very smallest applications, uh, I do continuous delivery on my website. When I update a blog entry, it goes through a pipeline that deploys it. Nick, you're working a lot with um, graph theory, graph databases. How does that fit into continuous delivery? Um, so one of the areas that uh, we're looking at at the moment is how you can use graph theory in order to to get some interesting insight into your microservice architecture. So we've, we've worked on uh, a few business-related projects, so things like social networks and um, you know, uh, things like infrastructure networks, but you can actually take some of that insight and apply that onto microservice architectures. So one of the things we've done is looking to maybe hook into some of the observability tools, things like Zipkin and stuff, and get some of the information out uh, as to which microservices uh, exist within the system, who they're calling, and then applying uh, things like uh, community detection algorithms and the like on that to actually work out uh, what your, your architecture might uh, give you some insight into that, which can help you to improve uh, what you have. So we keep referring to microservices and microservice architecture. Have we been waiting for microservices to, um, to be the new thing before all this made sense? I mean, I think that I think 
In general, microservices is 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 a complicated thing. is is very complicated. So um, and it's getting more complicated as people actually uh, start uh, building more services. So people are struggling to actually understand how these things fit together, uh, where some of the, the the bottlenecks are, and things like that. So I think the tooling and different techniques are coming out more and more to try and help people do that. Um, and I think this is. Uh, one area where uh, it's it's a new sort of area to explore in. I think it was probably possible before, um, but I think the problem is is more obvious now that there's so many more people doing it that there's there's different ways that we need to look at trying to get more insight. So continuous delivery, mm -hmm. I guess that didn't wait for microservices. Not really. Um, one of the things in, in the talk today I was talking about is that when we first started doing um, continuous delivery, it was still large monolith systems. And, and I don't want to make it that monolith bad, microservice good either, by the way. Um, if you're starting that Greenfield brand new project that we talked about a moment ago, um, to start it in a microservice type architecture where you don't know the business context yet um, probably isn't the right thing to do. It probably is right to create a monolith for that first then figure out where your business lines are, and then that defines your services and so forth. So we've been doing continuous delivery of, of monoliths for quite some time. There are gotchas at a certain size. You know, if the, if the system itself takes an hour and a half to deploy, then that stage of your pipeline takes an hour and a half to run, and there's no way around that. And so getting fast feedback about did this break our deployment and so forth became much more challenging. Um, also, just... Organization again comes back to organizational structure. People trying to get smaller pieces of ownership, uh, it becomes harder. There's certainly ways to do it. Microservices are not the only way. So component-based architectures and others, um, but the breaking it down makes it more complicated. But it doesn't have to be, if that makes sense. Yes, exactly. Because I have a feeling that microservices has just, in many ways, complicated mm -hmm. things like what we're talking about here now. If that is true then I guess we're on a journey where microservices is just one stop on a journey. So what comes after microservices? That's a big question. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so I think at the moment there's a, um, there's, there's a serverless versus microservices camp mm -hmm. or a fight, not fight, but a, a difference of opinion. I actually don't see it that way. I don't necessarily see it as either microservices or uh, serverless. I do think that moving towards a architecture where you get, you use more managed services is the way to go. But I think there are also different architectures: serverless architectures, uh, truly serverless architectures, FAS based, and and microservices. And they offer different um, they offer different ways to do things. So I think in general there is a move towards more serverless and managed service style of 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 building components that way. So I don't think microservices are completely going to die. Um, however, I think the, what people actually perceive a microservice to be is going to change. So people have differing ideas on the size and all these type of things. And I think as more of the problems get surfaced, I think it'll merge back into slightly so bigger entities, but more sensible entities um, and a combination of, of serverless uh, architectures as well. What comes after continuous delivery then? You know, it's funny because um, continuous delivery started easy. You had a single thing that was going through a pipeline, and you might want to do some tests in parallel, but for the most part, it was a pretty straight path. Um, and then we started adding more distributed type systems where we didn't really know which components were talking to each other. And so the pipelines actually got a lot more complex. And we're, are, what kind of testing are we going to do to make sure that we're hitting a service API that's not even available during our testing. And they got really, really complex. What's interesting, though, is as things, I don't know the right word is, solidify, I guess, to where we really are understanding now that microservices, whether it be, I've heard an argument the other day that serverless is a microservice. It's just a different implementation. It's still a small thing that does one thing. And I don't know. But as these things get smaller and more self-contained, continuous delivery is actually getting easier. And so we see the rise of um, software as a service for CI and CD, where it, now, now we're back to simple linear pipelines. Because our small little piece of code that we're going to put onto you know, a serverless can be deployed in minutes or seconds, depending on how much testing you're doing. Uh, and so the pipelines have actually gotten more simple instead of the other way around. 
And I'd see that continuing, actually. Uh, what I hope to see next, though, is the pipelines learning from, like, the work that she was talking about. So learning from, okay, once it gets in production and we have true observability and we're learning what we're doing, hey, we, we found out we were doing something here that we really should be doing more compliance checks in the pipeline or different checks. Or, hey, we don't need to do those checks, but we do need to, you know, et cetera. So have the pipeline be considered part of the system and have it evolve as we learn more about the system as a whole. Will machine learning be part of that? I think it could be. Yeah, it certainly could be. I mean, I think in terms of some of the, uh, in terms of the talk that I gave on on graph theory and uh, using that to to analyze your architecture, um, there's certainly elements of um, machine learning that would be able to, I think, uh, do some interesting things on on some of the areas like grouping services and mm -hmm. understanding based on patterns of of how services evolve over time. What, what might be interesting uh, sort of areas to look at. So um, in time, I think, certainly, probably. I'm looking forward to take chapter two of this. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us today. <laughs> Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech for lots more content from the brightest minds in software development.